Hello and welcome to another lesson. Uh, up until now, we have learned many interesting things. We have learned that uh, there are many rules to lighting, but as long as you know the game, you can have total control over how it's going to play out. Previously, in both daytime and sunset scenarios, the sun strongly influenced the composition and everything that was happening in the scene. In the overcast, we had to switch our thinking because there was no sunlight anymore and everything was flooded with the ambient light. And in order to build depth, we had to use completely different ways. With night, we'll go even further and we'll do another switch in thinking. We'll start with very dark atmospheric lighting and we'll start adding more and more lights to build both composition and depth. Lots of cool stuff and as you can see on the screen. We're going to cover nighttime rendering, the blue hour to be specific. And this lesson is a deep theoretical dive into nighttime rendering. No practice today, even though we'll show you how things can be made. We'll show you a finished scenario, but we're gonna click through everything from A to Z in the next lesson. Nevertheless, we hope you'll like it, and as usual, Let's get into the nighttime uh, mindset and discover the rules of the game. Now, there might be many variations of the nighttime scenario. There are many possible ones when the sun starts to go just below the horizon. Everything from a complete lack of atmospheric light through the very popular blue hour, when we have intensively blue atmospheric lights to some delicate colors of late twilight, which may not be so popular in architectural visualizations, but have some fans in the world of photography. It's worth noting that the logic of nighttime lighting is a consequence of an overcast logic. Actually, there are situations when we don't even know whether we are dealing with a fairly dark overcast or a fairly bright dusk, as in these examples and the transition between the two can be quite subjective and fluid. A range of fascinating and emotionally packed scenarios. We have prepared some images presenting a range from our late evening hours till the middle of the night. Each of them is a commercial work, and nighttime scenarios are really just a creative sandboxes for basically any mature artist. In film, photography and concept art, we can find truly epic images, sometimes evoking extreme emotions. In movies and illustrations, we can look for this heavier and more disturbing feeling. We can also come across architectural visualizations playing on those not so commercial emotions, going for this raw, barren mood. And this crude and heavy mood also comes out through the choice of colors, right? We can also find color palette escaping this typical duality of warm and cold. Like for example, monochromatic themes with moonlight or sodium lamp light. We can go for a pale cyan color or mercury lamps that immediately drive us to a heavily retro atmosphere. And again, we have various styles from the most popular blue and red to countless palettes of street neons. Generally, in the nighttime, a lot of new possibilities are allowed. Our filter of naturalism is lowered significantly, so there's more room for experimenting with color and thus playing with emotions, and we can use it for our benefit. And this is just a taste of what the night is really about. But today, we are going to start with something basic. We'll focus on the most popular scenario which you'll be able to use in almost any commercial work, which is Blue Hour. But why should you consider doing a nighttime scenario in the first place? So, for one, the night carries a lot of emotional baggage. The nature of this baggage depends on our execution of this scenario. The night can evoke anxiety and nostalgia, but it can also evoke the impression of luxury and coziness. And we can play on all these emotions depending on who our client is and of course 
and architectural visualization, we usually look for this luxury vibe. And by showing the building during the blue hour, we can focus on its most important features. We want to emphasize specific parts that the architect or our client simply wants to sell. The most important technical features of the building or sales features such as a terrace, lobby and arcades. These are often elements that take up a substantial part of the budget and are supposed to determine its perception. And it's not always possible to showcase them during the day. So from now on, you can slowly get used to the thought that the night will trigger the switch in your thinking. You will start showcasing different attributes than before and add lights to do it, rather than cutting it off, which has been the case up until now. The night is quite unique, not only because we will be adding on the lighting, but also because of the crucial role of the interiors, precisely those areas that we see through the glass. During the day, the outside of the building is definitely brighter and switching on artificial lights doesn't really make any difference because they are simply hundreds of times weaker than sunlight. The interiors can draw attention only if some dark reflections appear on the glass or if sunlight hits directly some objects inside. And of course, sometimes clients press us to show the interiors during the day. So we play along and set the artificial lights much stronger than it's uh, in reality. But even that has its limits, which we shouldn't cross if we don't want to completely break with the realism. And the blue hour is unique in this context because the intensity of the external light is similar to the internal one. We don't have some super bright sunlight dominating our scene. On the outside, the objects are still visible, but they don't dominate. This creates an aesthetically appealing ratio and sets the whole image in nice direction. In the nighttime scenario, we simply get additional tools in the form of artificial light and lighting in general. We have complete freedom to build a relationship with ambient lighting. We have a lot of flexibility to show the interior and we should use it with no hesitation, even if there is not that much glass in our scene. Okay, so I think we are in the right mindset. Now we can basically follow the light building logic we have started using in the overcast. We are adding more layers of light. It is additive lighting, which means we build it layer by layer, like building blocks. We add them together. We have to consider whether we are adding something that makes sense, architectural wise, and is it naturalistic? Could such light even exist at all? Or is it something we have just made up? It's really easy to overcomplicate the lighting and flood the entire scene with it. That's why we have to be meticulous, have a plan, implement it, and draw conclusions as we go. In this lesson, we'll touch base on different lighting possibilities, both artistically and technically. First, we'll analyze it with some examples, just to expose ourselves to the most diverse situations and spaces. That means we are not going to discuss it in the provided scene that we are working on. Instead, we are going to explore it in the courtyard scene. We'll show you what a finished scenario looks like and share some 3ds Max viewports just to wrap your head around the nighttime logic and possible tools. In the next lesson, we'll use all this knowledge and recreate all the steps from scratch. So don't worry, you're not missing out on anything here and feel free to apply those steps before even watching the next lesson. Would it be cool to see where we both landed eventually? Okay. In almost all nighttime scenarios, we follow a certain pattern. So before we jump into each step, let's outline what a completed scenario would look like in literally two sentences so you know what comes up next. We start with atmosphere light. Then we add interior lights. Then architectural lights. And finally, we try to light up the landscape. We start from the heart of the visualization, that is the interiors, 
and step by step illuminate the objects that are getting closer and closer to the camera. And of course, at each stage, there will be a trick to make it all work. Sounds easy, right? So let's go into the details of each step. Let's start with the base. And our first step will be adding atmospheric lighting, which is ambient light. And we need to remember, just like with the overcast, we are setting the base and later we'll add the lights. So we can't set the base too high. The right level should allow for the shadows to be just readable. So the whole thing will seem far too dark at this stage. And we just have to accept it. In terms of tint, there might be different situations like twilight, which is not necessarily bluish, or blue hour, where the light of the sky is very blue and basically floods the whole scene, from shadows to highlights basically, with a strong blue tint. We will use the HDRI map here to set it up, so nothing new at this point. And don't worry, we will set this up in our scene in the next lesson, but for now, let me just say that evening HDRIs don't require such wide ranges as daytime ones. Most of the available HDRIs should work just fine. Usually we go for clean gradients of the evening sky and that's what we have chosen here. Additionally, it plays well with commercial overtones and gives dynamic but very clear reflections. In our case, we go for PG Skies 1958 but feel free to choose 3D Collective 2257 as well. We increase the exposure of this HDRI regardless of what we see here in the background. And depending on the scene, HDRI can be enough to build a solid base atmospheric lighting. However, it may also turn out that something is still missing. That's exactly what's the case in this scenario. The foreground and the middle ground are illuminated but the building disappears here somewhere. It's blending with the greenery in the background. In effect, it's hard to understand what the scene is all about. And I know I just told you that the image is going to be dark and we need to accept it. However, this doesn't mean we should completely forget about our composition. That brings us to the second part of the step one, which is relight. And it is not always mandatory but worth thinking about. We can take it into our own hands and decide about it through artificial lighting. It's the same approach we use with the overcast scenario. We add lights that are in no way physically related to the scene. They are simply abstract points of light, which will give light and artistically improve the base lighting. It's basically cheating. You gotta do what you gotta do, you know? The relight can improve the impression of our atmospheric lighting, where we intentionally want it to appear. And as a result, we'll have a more attractive base for further work. It's best if you use quite large lights with low intensity, which will evenly and organically flood the relevant areas with light. And the gradients of the resulting lights and shadows will be very soft and basically no one should know that there's an extra light here. We recommend using ordinary corona spheres for this purpose. As we can see here in this scheme, we have inserted four spheres, one's a little smaller. This way, the lighting of the body creates a harmonious and more readable hierarchy of the scene. We know what the picture is about. Tonal ranges are still low, but readability is definitely much better. You can always use relighting for that. Pretty neat trick. Remember though, we want to preserve the naturalism of atmospheric light, so the added relighting is relatively weak and close in color temperature to our HDRI. So these lights are quite cold, like 8K, 9K Kelvin. We also remember not to reveal the presence of the relight by the visibility of the light points in large reflection. So here, first of all, we need to control its reflections on the surface of the water we have here. So let's compare the images before and after relighting. 
we can see that the added light introduces a slight bluish gradient on the left side, making this facade simply more attractive. The central light enhances the readability of the stone textures on the wall. The wood here at the back is also emphasized, as well as the yard itself, and the entire center of the composition becomes brighter and more attractive. We can also use a disc or rectangle directional light instead of a sphere, so feel free to check out what works best for you. We will explore this in more detail in the next lesson, but for now, let's stop at those spheres. They are probably the simplest solution. So at this stage, we are done with step number one, which means we have a solid base for our render and the effect should be quite naturalistic. I mean, if we would really come to this place in the evening and all artificial lights would be turned off, we should expect this exact view. The ranges are low, but the overall readability of the scene has been preserved. And now we can move on to the second step, which is the interior light. This layer will build a solid point of interest and introduce the first commercial aspect of this visualization. So again, Step number two is the interior lighting. The approach to interior lighting may vary depending on what the building looks like, what our interiors look like and their scale. You will deal differently with a huge office building or rather a single family house. So let's start these considerations with the fact that we should have something to show inside the interiors in the first place. We don't want to illuminate just an empty space. This would only emphasize the fact that our scene is incomplete. And usually, we don't have to go strong on the details. For the most part, it's just some kind of addition to the visualization of the exterior. Often, the viewer will not go into details too much. And the readability will be blurred even more if we have some reflections on the glass against the background of the interior. Unless we need to show something pretty specific, like a hotel lobby, then we'll have to go along with the design layout. But anyway, we want interiors to be there, to signal to the viewer that the interior is not empty. We want to make the interior more credible, but we don't want to overdo it. Now, let's point something out here. In theory, you should get the lighting specification from your client. However, in, in real life, None of this will happen in most cases. Even if we get references and a lighting scheme, it's usually purely functional and quite random from our point of view. And what I'm trying to say is that sooner or later, the ability to quickly improvise artificial lighting will become handy. But don't worry, even if you have nothing to do with design, in this lesson, we'll outline a very simple typology that will work in almost every case. You will get a simple solutions and handy advice that will help you deliberately and purposefully illuminate most commercial interiors. So, circling back, we throw some random stuff into the interiors, chairs, plants, furniture, anything really, so at least something flickers there. And now we have to decide how to illuminate them in general, and here, we have two ways to go about it. We can illuminate the interiors in a uniform way so that the entire space seems to be filled with light or we can introduce this lighting in a non-uniform way with brighter and darker areas, some gradients, single lamps and cove lighting. And here you can see examples of uniform lighting and some examples where the regularity is disturbed in some way. In the second example, part of the interior remains in the shadow. In the third one, we have very clear lighting gradients. And in the fourth one, additional light sources differ in color temperature. And I think we can intuitively reject the last one as something that will not work. Mixed color temperatures gives the impression that someone just accidentally screwed in random light bulbs, which is, you know, let's say, unwanted. We want to create the impression of a meticulously designed interior. 
and consistency in this aspect will certainly help to make it more credible. Just as a side note, mixing the color temperatures uh, of light within one space rarely ends well in general, especially in commercial work. You need a lot of experience to pull off something like this. So I would advise you to stick to one color, even in uh, very large and diverse scenes, like for entire skyscrapers. Typically, uh, we want to narrow down our color palettes and having different color, uh, color temperatures only make our work in post-production harder. And don't worry uh, if that uniform temperature will kill all the new ones. After all, you have different materials and objects in the interiors, so the final overtone will be very different and diverse anyway. So, let's reject this variant. The other three seem quite acceptable, so we can take a closer look at them. So, why should we choose the first option? Based on my experience, I can confidently say the first variant of lighting will work in the vast majority of cases in commercial exteriors. If the interior itself is not the subject of the visualization, but rather an element of the composition, then it can be illuminated with uniform light throughout. This way, the viewer will be able to understand the render as a whole, because the interior will be composed as an independent fragment of the image. We understand that this is the interior, a distinct block of the image, not some hot mess that's difficult to get the hang of. This is much easier to read in the overall composition. Let's just look at this image. We see that the interior is basically completely filled with light. And sure, we are able to distinguish, for example, slightly brighter light cones, but in general, the level of brightness between the floor, the wall and the ceiling doesn't differ that much. These are very similar ranges. However, if we only add the physically correct lights that match the lighting specification, it quickly turns out that this is insufficient, or at least it can be. Let's take a look at this visualization. As we can see on the specification, we have complete ceiling lighting here. We have spots, we have hanging lights, and all the ceiling lighting isn't enough to fill the whole space with light. And if we think about it, it's really not a surprise at all, because the rendering engine calculates just a limited number of light bounces, while the reference photographs, with extended exposure time, have no such restrictions. And of course, this interior has a slightly different scale than the reference from the photo. It's more open. There are different, darker materials that add to this effect of poor overall lighting even more. This does not change the fact that in order to illuminate this interior as a whole, we have to use relight. So, just like we did with our base, we have to introduce some non-existing lamps here to flood the interior with light. And in renderings, we basically have to think of the desired result and just get there. So, the same rules apply here as in any other relight we discuss. The key is thinking of the result and not overdoing it. Moderation and naturalness. And as usual with the relight, we have just added a bunch of corona spheres here and lined them up against the wall. That did the job pretty nicely, and we recommend using a similar setup whenever illuminating interiors in a blue hour scenario. Let's just consider the second variant now, just for a moment. The second variant gives us a lot of undefined shadows. We have these dark areas here and there, which are not necessarily bad. This will work well in a situation where the whole environment is strongly lit when there's a lot of light here on the architecture, on the facade, and in the landscape. In those cases, going with this undefined, underlit interior will give us a little breath, and it will create a nice contrast. What can we say about the third variant? When could you expect something like this would be an optimal solution? Well, I think dramatic gradients like these work well in artistic projects. Let's take a look here. 
especially if we consider it as a small accent. As we can see here, just a touch. It's just a highlight, not a complete interior lighting system. However, in a commercial project, we would rather go for this uniform fade with light. Okay, so we have two steps behind us. At this point, we have built the atmospheric lighting, which is our base, and we have set up the interior light. We still have two steps to go to make the image much more attractive commercially. The next step would be architectural lighting. By that, we mean all artificial lights that will illuminate our building from the outside. And to execute this step the best, we'll need to understand the basic rules that govern architecture, how it's built and where are the distinct materials. What was the architect's intention? What should be emphasized with the light? And what should be left in the shadow? This may sound like a very complicated task, but it really boils down to very basic insights. In general, we want to accentuate the facade against the background and turn it into something attractive. One of the easiest solutions will simply be regular illumination of the entire facade. This is a surprisingly straightforward solution, but it usually works just fine. You can use a lighting plane with relatively low intensity and point the light upwards. You can also cheat a bit and just include some elements, for example the wood, to selectively illuminate those. Wood has a warm color, so we can additionally emphasize it with a warm light. Nice and simple trick. However, this kind of lighting is usually customized. We should always try to think if a given light makes sense functionally and could it actually exist in this space. We don't want to introduce any gimmicky solutions and it's even better to let it go than to do something we are not sure about. Uh, it's very easy to go overboard. Simple minimalistic architecture might benefit from some accents and it's best to talk to your contractor or architect to have some solid direction. Over time, you'll get a hang of it. Either way, we have some ideas you can keep in mind while placing the architectural lights. If you don't feel confident in this area or the architecture is chaotic, you can always go with something simple. For example, highlighting only the characteristic elements of the structure, such as the entrance zone or the corners. That's the easiest way. And the second piece of advice would be to use either linear lighting or point lighting. Linear lights create uniform gradients and are easy to place, while point lights work best at a regular distance from each other to create certain rhythms. Like here, we see floor spotlights and sconces, and in both versions, their arrangement creates a certain pattern of light and shadow. We can see alternating areas of light and shadow, and this sequence adds visual interest to the space and builds an additional layer of the composition. Just one last thing about this step. Remember that architectural lighting must stay in harmony with interior lighting. You don't want to go overboard with both at the same time, because for one to stand out, the other cannot be so aggressive. Interior lighting looks better against the darker facade and architectural lighting goes better with darker interiors. And of course, you can combine both of them, but you have to be careful not to end up with something flooded with light. Just play with it based on some contrast. And here, for example, we choose alternative irregular interior lighting. This one gives us a little more breadth in relation to the illuminated facade. The regular internal lighting is also okay, and the client would probably be delighted to see everything illuminated in this manner. Although, in this case, perhaps the first option has a bigger punch, because it gives us some breadth in relation to the illuminated facade. Okay, three steps down, one step to go. The architecture is nicely illuminated but the whole courtyard stays in the shadow. It is inaccessible, even hard to read at times. We want to make it more alive, increase its readability and make it feel safe and cozy. So last step 
is the landscape lights. And you can approach them in a similar fashion as we did in the previous step. Of course, you can and should use references. For smaller projects, look for garden landscape design, and for larger projects, you might want to explore entire courtyards or campuses. Just wrap your head around it and have a feeling of what you're up against. Anyway, in general, we want to highlight certain areas, increasing their readability. We can highlight the trees, we can highlight these grassy islands, and we are trying not to flood the entire space with light. Just making small light accents that will form the perception of the environment. That's the key here. Just a touch here and there. And you can choose several options here, but we'll just list the most popular ones. We can illuminate objects or illuminate space. This might sound puzzling, but it will all become clear soon. By objects, we usually mean plants. As we said, trees, bushes, those grassy islands, greenery, but also small architecture like benches or garden furniture. Try to illuminate them from behind to outline their edges. Greenery goes really well with this technique. When light hits it from behind, the translucency starts to pop. This helps to build the readability and attractiveness of the space. At the same time, it doesn't overload it with light. However, you're free to illuminate anything from the front or from the side, if you want a slightly stronger accent. And sometimes we will have more characteristic objects, such as swimming pool, which may call for an individual approach. But whatever you do, you have the same goal in general, which is to isolate these objects from a dark environment. That's illuminating the objects. Now, moving on to illuminating the space. Now, the simplest example of space illumination would be street lamps. They don't illuminate any specific objects, they don't illuminate a specific tree or a small architecture, but they do separate a piece of space. So, we'll apply a slightly different method here. And to light the space, we obviously have to have an empty space in the scene. And by empty space, I mean there are no characteristic objects in it. The empty space can be a sidewalk, a lawn, or a gravel path. And in our courtyard scene, an abundance of empty space. We have, for example, a lot of flat, gravel surface. Now, there's obviously some logic we can apply in this step as well. The best and the easiest way is to try to create some repetition or sequencing with the light. Just one or two lights may come across as random, while five lamps have a chance to build an additional compositional layer to introduce a certain rhythm. Just as you can use rhythm in the architectural lighting, you can do the same in the landscape lighting. Constant differences between the lights make the depth of the space easy to understand and often lead the eye very nicely to the main subject of the image. And sometimes justifying their placement will require the presence of a physical model, some sort of spotlight fixture like here, or some bollards, or even some kind of self-illuminated object. You can create this type of light with the default corona disc or iris, but more on that later, mostly in the next lesson. Alternatively to lighting the space this way, you may build rhythms using light fixtures alone. Lights don't even have to illuminate our scene, but their mere presence and contrast with the surroundings will simply create the impression of depth. So let's connect the dots one last time. The first step is atmospheric light that means setting up HDRI and possibly introducing a relight if the scene needs it. The second layer is the interior light. It can be regular or irregular. The third layer is architectural light. It can cover a given area, like an entire facade. It can be linear or consist of spots. And the last, fourth layer, giving us the most freedom, is the landscape lighting. This is where the most magic is going on. You can illuminate specific objects here, 
you can also illuminate the space itself to create certain rhythms. So these are the four layers. It doesn't mean that all four of them have to always be in every night visualization. Of course, the base must be there every time. However, we don't have to illuminate architecture in every single project. You'll make the decision depending on the task at hand. Now, we are going to do a little teaser of what's coming in the next lesson and how it will relate to what we have just learned. As you can see, we have our scene here and we'll build it using the same logic. So first, we'll introduce atmospheric lighting with HDRI. It will be quite low, quite dark, just as we discussed a moment ago. Then, we'll introduce a relight to build the base to bring the facade out of the shadows. Then we'll start introducing the interior lighting. First we'll illuminate the ground floor, then the first floor, and bam, the whole building gains a nice commercial look already. After the interior lighting, we'll move on to the architectural lighting. And there will be not so much to do here. In our case, we don't want to overload the scene with lighting. We need a nice relationship between interior and architectural lighting. So we'll introduce architectural lighting in moderation. We'll highlight certain fragments, mainly to add to the distinction between the ground floor and the first floor. But we'll try to not overdo it and keep the architectural lighting in check. After we finish this step, we'll create something that works customarily for the scene. We'll use lights to increase the impression of the luminosity from the building onto the surroundings. We are going to add some lights behind the building, some lights here on the terrace, and it's going to be kind of an extension of the interior light. We want to create the impression that the light from within pours outside and ties the whole scene together, so to say. Physically, however, we won't be able to illuminate it with the interior lights alone, or the architectural lights, so we need to make use of the relight again. And yeah, we love to use relight quite often. It's honestly a great tool at your disposal. So, once you have illuminated the building surroundings, we'll move on to the last step, which will finally give the scene that oomph, and set up the whole composition. We'll move on to the landscape lighting, and only after we apply it, we'll have the whole composition just as we designed it. We'll do exactly the same thing we did in this lesson. Atmosphere, interior, architectural and landscape lighting. All with a little twist to suit a slightly different scene. But in general, the logic will be exactly the same. Okay, that was quite a lot to digest and we know it might seem a little bit overwhelming, but it really boils down to just these four steps. We wanted to give you a taste of what kind of beast we are up against here. You can always come back to this lesson if you missed, uh, if you missed anything, but really all of it uh, will come naturally with time. So thanks and see you in the next one.